Let's keep in mind the previous video that we talked about God sending demons because he's sovereign and the devil's not getting one over on God. Uh, and let's keep that in mind and let's read a couple other scriptures and then try to understand exactly what these mean. Mark 16 verse 17 and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils and it goes on from there but that's the point that i wanted to get then luke chapter 10 verses 19 through 20 behold i give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And so how how do we jive the two things of God sends the demon, but then God gives us authority, some measure of authority against the demon? Like how, what a, what a weird thing. Why would God do that? How do you explain that? And I'm glad that I myself just asked my own question <laughs> because it gets, it starts to get to the heart of where we as humans find ourselves in this world. Okay. And I call that, the Bible calls that the enmity. So let's go to. Um, the garden in Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. Adam and Eve had just sinned. They're hiding from God. Of course, God knows. Um, no one has ever seen God, but Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. So Jesus is walking in the cool of the day in the garden of Eden. And he calls to the man. Right, And so this is where we pick up Genesis 3, 9 through 15. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and the dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So, first of all, let's just establish really quickly um, who this who the serpent is. Um, and this is Revelation 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And so, first of all, um, Satan, uh, he closed himself as an angel of light, right? He, he either presented himself as a serpent <clears throat> or he he possessed a serpent and took power over a serpent, right? And um, he beguiled the woman. He tempted her. She knew uh, the word of God and the word of which Adam had relayed to her. And the word of God was, don't eat it. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But she did anyway. She put her faith in the word of Satan more so than the word of God. And, and you, faith always results in action. I mean, what does a belief matter if you believe something but you never act on the belief? 
I mean, it kind of implies you don't really believe it very much, right? Um, you breathe because you believe that the activity of breathing is going to result in something, namely you getting air in your lungs and continuing to live. You do, you eat, you go to the bathroom, you drink water, on and on and on and on. Because you, you believe that there's a, a, a causal relationship, right? Um, the woman may have said that she believed the word of God, but what was the word that she acted on? She acted on Satan's word. She, Jesus, she put her faith in Satan's word. She believed him and she obeyed him, basically. Did God say? God did not say, you shall not die, right? So this verse that I really want to focus on is um, verse 15, Genesis 3.15. This is called the... Uh, First preaching of the gospel that I may not 100% pronounce this correctly, Proto-Evangelion, um, which is the, the first good news, the first preaching of the gospel. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And so thee is Satan. The woman is Eve. Between thy seed. So Satan has seed, those who belong to him. And her seed which are all the sons of men, the children that ultimately belong to her. And so we, we immediately get a distinction between people who belong to Satan and people who belong to God, um, which I'm sure is not a popular doctrine in the church, right? Because if, if you're, you're trying to, the church is trying to save everybody that comes in the door, you're probably not going to tell the people that are coming in the door, oh, by the way, your children are Satan. There may be some, but I, I suspect that uh, not too many mega churches are preaching such a message. Um, but it's what Jesus taught. Um, okay, we'll put enmity between thee and the woman, so between Satan and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And ultimately, I mean, in a general sense, <clears throat> her seed is... In a general sense, her seed is all of humanity, but in a specific sense, we're talking about Christ, right? It shall, or he shall bruise thy head. And so the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of Satan, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Satan will bruise the heel of the son of Eve, who ultimately would be the Christ, Messiah. Okay, so just in a very, in a, in a, and I'm not saying that it's completely clear and that we know every single thing about the gospel by no means, but this, I believe, um, I've been praying about like, God, what is, what is the enmity? Like, I know that it's important. I know that we're like in this sort of war, spiritual war, but how do I, how do I talk about it? Like, how do I? What do we need to know? And the, 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 the important thing, which goes along the lines of God sending demons that we recognize in verse 15, I will put enmity. And so if, if there is, and there is enmity between us and the devil, God did it. It's not just some random thing out there and we're just like, oh no, like, God did it, and he did it for a reason, and he did it for our good and for his glory, primarily for his glory, because everything he does is for his glory. And so he is using the circumstance of the devil, and I think probably in the next video we're going to talk about the kinds of things that the devil does, you know, devourer and accuser and so on, resistor and all, all of the terms that the Bible gives the devil. But God is using the presence of the devil and his demons to purify us and train us and raise us up. And so con consider 2 Timothy 2.12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. The Bible teaches... Um, Jesus said in Matthew nineteen twenty eight, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging 
the twelve tribes of Israel. Luke twenty two twenty nine, And I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me. Right? And so, uh, we're going to be glorified with Christ. We're going to be resurrected with Christ. We are going to reign in the kingdom, the everlasting kingdom of God and of Christ. And God is preparing us. And that preparation is not, oh, I just want to feel good all the time. Oh, just comfort and convenience me because I think that's what should happen. Like who who goes to any kind of a rigorous curriculum and they just they just are coddled and just feel good and everything goes their way? How many times do you get an F on a test? Or how many times do you you just don't you don't study how you should have? And you you get knocked down. But God uses this in order to pre- prepare and train us for his glory. And so the fact that God left the devil on the earth, going to and fro throughout the earth, right? Walking up and down on it. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't an oversight on his part. It was deliberate action that he said that he was going to do. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Uh, the other way that they translate this from the original Hebrew is hatred. Um, the devil hates us and he wants to destroy us. Now God, just like in Job, God said, you touch his body, but spare his life. Like the Holy Spirit is restraining the devil. If the devil if the devil could, if God gave him leave, he would take a dagger to our throat and cut it. There'd be no pangs of conscience. There'd be no question, no doubt. Jesus said in John 8, 44, there is no truth in him. He was a murderer from the beginning. If the devil could kill us, he wouldn't think a thing about it. He would just immediately whoop, do it and then move on to the next thing. He wouldn't even think about it. It's not it's a no for him, it's a no brainer. Just I can kill the sons of God. Whoop, perfect. <laughs> what else can I do, right? Right? There's no pangs of conscience for him. Um, but God restrains the devil and does not allow the devil to do whatever it is that he wants to do. If the devil were allowed to have free reign on the earth, we would all already be dead. And probably the way that we would be dead is not because he took a dagger to our throat, but because we we killed each other or our own selves. Because if you've ever had a thorn in your flesh, like Paul had a thorn in his flesh, if you've ever been tormented by the enemy, if you've ever been strongly influenced by the enemy, and let me tell you something, anybody who's walking on the front lines of the kingdom of God has encountered the enemy. Um, he is able to, and re- recall from previous teachings, he is a spirit. Our mind is a spirit. How does he tempt? Does he tempt our? Does he tempt my pinky? Ooh, ooh. No, he tempts my mind because my mind is my rational faculty where I make decisions and I make choices. He doesn't tempt my pinky. He tempts my mind, and my mind is my part of my mind is my human spirit, or part of my human spirit is my mind, right? And so. My point in saying this is he's inherently compatible. It's not like um, apples and oranges here. We're talking about two absolutely compatible spirit systems. One spirit influencing another spirit. He's able to put thoughts in our minds. He's able to give us attitudes and emotions and desires and feelings and philosophies. He's able to directly interface with our mind because he is a spirit and our mind is a spirit. So uh, we find ourselves in this scenario and and I want to point out um, finally in this video I want to point out, I think that everything with respect to what I just said when I began, why would God send the devil, 
but then give us a measure of authority against the devil because he's teaching us to fight. And we see that exact scenario. And of course, we know as the gospel and the the uh, so-called passion of Christ is played out, um, there will be enmity. It shall bruise thy head. So Jesus is going to bruise his head. Um, recall the the word bruise can also be translated crush, uh, right? Which is a fatality, um, ultimately. Um, recall that um, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 16 that the God of peace will soon crush Satan beneath your feet, right? And so we live our lives in a sense as a, as a reflection of what either was going to happen or did happen to Messiah. And so... Christ must suffer, Christ must rise, gospel must go to the ends of the earth. In a sense, that is the pattern of our life. Christ must suffer because Satan bruised his heel. Satan, guess what? Satan's going to bruise our heel. The, the idea that we're just going to strut about and Satan's never going to touch us a trillionth of a trillionth and we're just going to just go do whatever we want. That's just... Our adversary, like a lion, devours and he destroys, and he oppresses, and he puts people in bondage. The idea that Satan can't touch us is absurd. Somebody who's who's forwarding that um, philosophy, I'm not going to even call it a theology, I'm going to call it a philosophy. Someone who forwards the philosophy that Satan can't touch us hasn't hasn't been on the front lines. Jesus, they 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 apparently don't know very much about what it means to live in the real world. Because in the real world, there's deep suffering and there's deep cruelty and wickedness. And even among Christians, right? The Crusades, like Christians do sinfully wicked things all day, every day. The idea that we're immune to sin is blindness. I don't, even, I don't know what else to call it. But he shall bruise thy head. The God of peace shall soon crush Satan beneath your feet. And so we see this, the victory of Christ. And again, this verse is cryptic, but we know how it plays out because we have the rest of the Bible, right? We understand that um, Satan is going to tempt Jesus. He's going to resist Jesus. Uh, he's going to have. He's going to inspire Simon or Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. He's going to inspire Simon Peter to deny Jesus. Um, ultimately, Jesus is going to go to a cross, the Roman cross. But Christ, or God is going to resurrect him and destroy the power of the devil. Right. And so, in the same way, we are not fighting against flesh and blood. We are struggling against powers, spiritual powers of wickedness in the heavenly places, against de the devil and his wiles. If we're not fighting, and there's not, like, skin in the game, then why do we have armor? Oh, I don't need to put on my armor because the devil can't touch me. Oh, well, why did God give something that you don't need? <laughs> and a sword to fight against them. If the devil can't touch you, why in the world do you need a sword? Right? Why do you need a shield? So the point is the pattern the pattern that we see in Christ's life and the pattern that we see in this verse, which is directly related to the enmity that I've been talking about, is that there's a suffering. But through the suffering, God produces an eternal weight of glory. And the end of the matter is that we will reign with Christ forever. And so this is the situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, a difficult, costly, bloody battle. But the end result is fruit of righteousness that will never, ever end.